Virgin Most Powerful Radio, sharing the gospel with clarity and charity. And now, Virgin Most Powerful Radio is pleased to present Hands-On Apologetics with renowned Catholic author and apologist, Gary Machuda. And welcome, everybody. Hands on Apologetics. You have entered into Virgin Most Powerful's Apologetics Dojo, and it's great to be with you today to dive into this thing we call Hands on Apologetics, where we learn how to explain, defend the faith with clarity, charity, and confidence. And uh, got an awesome show in store for you today because it's a longtime friend uh, that uh, I've talked to and I've emailed over the years. Actually, it's a mutual friend of Steve Ray. Uh, who was, grew up evangelical Protestant and eventually became Catholic. So Jeremy Darling is going to be joining us. He's a, a musician, an actor, and he's going to share his journey of faith into the Catholic Church, and uh, that's going to be a ton of fun, and I can't wait to chat with him. That's going to be coming up on the other side of the break. Um, also, we do our Finding the Fallacy. Uh, today's Friday. And that means that we take a break from informal fallacies and look at propaganda. As you know, propaganda is uh, not defective argument. In fact, it's the absence of an argument. It's a way to manipulate people emotionally and otherwise to accept, believe, or act on a certain thing. And today's propaganda technique is the cult of personality. And also we made an early church father for today. He is a, a very unusual father in that he uh, he became Christian and ran so quickly into the front door, he ran out the back door into heresy. And that is Tertullian. So uh, lots of really cool stuff in store for us today. But I'm seeing at the corner of my eye several emoji explosions occurring on YouTube so let me begin by giving my shout out. Hello, everybody there watching live stream on Facebook, YouTube, and all the other platforms that we uh, stream live to. Welcome. Yes, it's great to see you. Thank you. Very colorful emojis, I must say. A very nice selection. <laughs> and also, I want to welcome all of you listening on radio around the country and also via podcast around the world through our handy-dandy phone app or our flagship powerhouse website, which is virginmostpowerfulradio.org. And, uh, yeah, just go there, click on our shows, scroll down to Hands-On Apologetics, and bam, you have all our shows. And that's a great way to do apologetics in place, share uh, Catholic content with other people, and uh, so you can share the program, tell them about the show. And by the way, you know, I say this every episode, but please do this because it really helps out a lot. Is uh, if you haven't subscribed to Hands On Apologetics on YouTube, uh, please do so because uh, the more subscribers and also the more feedback that we get on the show online uh, really does help the visibility and that helps evangelism. So uh, I know many of you have already subscribed. I want to thank you for that. And I also want to thank all of you who are about to subscribe. Uh, we truly do appreciate it. Speaking of YouTube, you know, I just want to remind people that I started a new project. Uh, it is called the Apocrypha Apocalypse Project on YouTube. If you haven't checked it out, uh, please do. Just type in Apocrypha Apocalypse. That should probably bring up uh, the channel. And what I'm going to do on that channel is I have so much information about these seven Old Testament books that are missing in Protestant Jewish Bibles, but they're found in the Catholic and Orthodox Bibles, that I'm going to start producing some short videos. And God willing, you know, we'll get some visibility and really put this information out there because there's a lot of our separated brethren that are missing books of the Bible. And again, that's Apocrypha Apocalypse. So I, I appreciate it if you could, you know, check it out, subscribe, do all those social media type things. I'm, I'm very new to that. So any help I can get, I will gladly take it. Uh, let's see. Okay, well, hey, enough about me. Let's jump to our Finding the Fallacy for today. The Finding the Fallacy, like I said, it's a propaganda technique. It's the cult of personality. 
and the cult of personality arises when a country's regime or sometimes an individual uses techniques of mass media propaganda the big lie spectacle arts patriotism so on and so forth to create an idealized uh, heroic and worshipful image of a leader and it's uh, which often receive unquestioning flattery and praise so uh, uh the cult of personality is uh you know building up somebody kind of making him into a a idealized cardboard figure so that just whatever the person says uh people tend to believe with that uncritically and just accept it simply because of that image and uh like i said that's through usually through a uh, constant reinforcement of unquestioning flattery and praise so uh that is our propaganda technique for today the cult of personality and uh, let's meet the early church father shall we today's early church father is tertullian Tertullian, very interesting early church father. He was born around AD 155, 160, died around 240, 250. Uh, he was born in Carthage of pagan parents, and sometime between the years 155 and 160 AD, he became a lawyer of considerable repute, and after his conversion around 193 AD, his expert knowledge in the field of law was turned to the defense of Christianity. Jerome says that Tertullian was a priest. Opinion on this point, however, has been much divided. For example, the patrologist uh, Jake Quashton uh, remarks that the great respect for his writings, that his writings enjoy, is inexplicable if he was not a cleric. He might counter his argument by stating that the great respect for the man's writings may have been evidenced by, in two ways, of appealing to his authority or by the wide use of writings. Uh, in Tertullian's case, his writings are quoted considerably by later authors, but oftener than not, it's a, in an anonymous manner. This can be accounted for by the genuine excellence of his writings, apart from any particular respect for his person. Uh, certainly, his writings are wide known and widely read, but again, uh, this is understandable quite apart from his person. So uh, his literary activities embraced the years 197 to 220. Within the span of nearly 25 years, his numerous writings fall into three fairly distinct periods. This is really important, folks, to understand because not all of Tertullian's writings are, are solid and orthodox. He has his uh, uh, Catholic period, which is between 197 and 206, and then... <clears throat> which, by the way, these writings are marked for their orthodoxy. Then he has what's known as the semi-Montanist period, which is from 206 to 212. And this is where he starts flirting with this heresy known as Montanism. And uh, there is no heresy or schism called semi-Montanism. So apparently, you know, this is where he begins to flirt with it. And then the final period is between 213 and 220. And this is where his literary works really do indicate that he has passed over into the camp of the Montanist. His rigorism has become extreme. He's anti, his anti-clericalism has reached the point of invective. And while he takes an exaggerated view of the priestly role of the layman, he clearly admits that his new charismatic prophets and prophetesses uh, of Montanism are the norm. So later on, by the way, after Tertullian's death, uh, we end up with a sect called the Tertullianist. So this is an interesting little add-on for this church father. Augustine knows of such a sect in Carthage at the end of the 4th century. It was he that converted the last of them. Some authors indicate that Tertullian outgrew even Montanism and became a founder of a sect bearing his name. More likely, his name simply was attached to the North African Montanist. He... Uh, uh, he being far and away the most prominent person in that circle. But whatever the numerous possibilities, it would seem most likely that the name Tertullianist uh, was attached to any group in his lifetime. Uh, after 220 AD, we hear, him, we hear of him no more, except for certain remarks of Jerome indicated that he lived for a number of years after 220 and died at a ripe old age age uh, dying probably as late as 240 
possibly as late as 250. And I, we mentioned this, by the way, on other segments of Hands On Apologetics in Meet the Early Church Fathers. We talked about Meniscus Felix, you know, that kind of obscure father. Uh, we mentioned, I, I think it was about probably four or five episodes ago. There's that interesting problem of whether Meniscus Felix or Tertullian deserves the title of the first Christian writer to write in Latin. And we mentioned in that program that the problem is it seems that uh, either Meniscus Felix or Tertullian kind of borrow from each other. And it's not really sure who borrowed from whom. Because, uh, you know, in the ancient world, there was no such thing as intellectual property like we have today. And it's not unusual at all for people to copy whole pages of documents without any kind of attribution. Um, so uh, depending on who ripped off whom, uh, the the originator deserves the title of the first Christian author to write in Latin. And uh, unfortunately, I don't think we'll ever solve that problem. So it's, it's either between Meniscus Felix or Tertullian. Um, and, and that's just kind of one of those cool things when you look at the early church uh, fathers. And that being said, that is our early church father for today, Tertullian. And, uh, yeah, check it out. Like I said, whenever you use Tertullian's writings, always keep those three periods in mind because, uh, you know, it reflects his own kind of travel out of the church. And uh, so you could read statements that are very orthodox, and then you could read statements from the same author that's kind of rather shocking. So, anyway, keep that in mind. I hear the music coming up. That means coming up to a break. Coming up on the other side of the break, we have Jeremy Darling coming on. We're going to talk about his journey of faith. Stay tuned, folks. Join VMPR live on YouTube September 12th, 2020 for our latest free conference, The Ultimate Challenge. This exclusive virtual event will feature a brand new talk from Jesse Romero, How Apologetics Brought Me Back to Faith, plus never before broadcast video presentations from Dr. Scott Hahn, Father Mitch Pacwa, and the late, great Father Benedict Groeschel. Go to vmpr.org to register now and get ready to face the ultimate challenge. Pro-life across America, the Billboard people. Did you know my mom's going to have a baby? She is. Will it be a boy? Or will it be a girl? We don't know yet, but we heard the heartbeat, and my dad said this is going to be someone very special. You mean like being a president? Or maybe a doctor? Well, probably maybe like a singer or dancer, I think. Hello, my name is Marianne Koharski. I'm the director of Pro-Life Across America. We know that every baby is a miracle and has the potential to do great things. If you know someone who is pregnant or in need of alternatives or assistance or would like to support the work of Pro-Life Across America, please call 1-800-366-7773 or visit our website at prolifeacrossamerica.org. Pro-Life Across America is non-political and totally educational. Pro-Life Across America This is Terry Barber. I want to thank you for your support here at Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Here's an easy way to do it. If you're going to sell or buy a house, call Real Estate for Life, 877-543-3871, because they're going to get you a Christ-centered agent to purchase your home or to sell your home. And at the close of escrow, a portion of his commission goes right back to Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Call 877-543-3871. Thank you so much for your support. Now, back to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda. If you'd like to join the conversation, call 888-526-2151. Here's Gary. 
And welcome back, everybody, to Hands-On Apologetics. And, you know, here at the dojo, we often have people come in and share their journey of faith. And today, I've been looking forward. I'm so psyched with this interview because it's a, a friend of mine, Jeremy Darling, who's a singer, songwriter, actor, speaker, mixed martial artist, uh, and uh, advocate for all sexual exploitations in all its forms. He's married to his only girlfriend, Gretchen, on September 1st, 2002, and they're currently raising their three sons in Minnesota. And, Jeremy, welcome to Hands on Apologetics. Hi, Gary. Thanks, brother. Hey, yeah, this has been a long time coming. I didn't know you are into mixed martial arts. I was, yeah. I come from a, I come from a line of... Uh, Fighters, liars, and musicians. So those are about the three things. I <laughs> don't lie, but acting's very much like lying. Um, I got into martial arts when I was about 10. Um, I started boxing very young, probably when I was about five. My dad wow. uh, taught me boxing. Um, but at one point, that was kind of my plan was to, to fight professionally. And then I met the girl that I would marry. And when I was 17, and I thought, you know, I think I just want to make babies with you. Um, and so I still teach and and train, um, but I don't I don't do it uh, as an amateur anymore. Okay. Yeah. Wow, that's cool. I didn't know that. Well, yeah. hey, uh, why don't we start from the beginning? Uh, you know, uh, let's start from uh, how you're raised, where you're raised. Sure. So I was born in 1981 uh, to Mark and Kathy Darling in uh, a little <clears throat> trader park in Ames, Iowa. Very poor. Um, my, my father came to know the Lord when he was 18, my mom at 15, they met in the rain, a little Christian, uh, uh, Bible event happening on the campus, uh, at Iowa state where my mom was going. And, uh, they were, I think, engaged two or three weeks later. That's kind of how my dad operates. And, um, uh, my sister was born 1980. I was born 1981. I have another younger sister and a, a little brother. We moved up to um, Minnesota, I think it was 86, 87, somewhere around there. I was about five years old. My dad was ordained as a pastor. We were part of a, a pretty large growing uh, movement of non-denominational churches. And he was ordained. A uh, pastor started a, uh, I guess, what would become one of the seeker churches in that uh, era of the 90s, late 80s, early 90s. And that was really our life. I was a pastor's kid. Now, I was the enigma um, among all pastors, kids, at least that I'd ever met. And that I really greatly loved and respected my father. He was the same man on stage as he was at home. Um, and wanted to be a great husband and a great father first and pastor and shepherd his church next to that. So, uh, he, we were his priority and his great passion in life. And a lot of that came really from, uh, his own father walking away from the Lord and my dad in many ways, rejecting the man that his father become had become, and uh, to this day, my dad is one of the greatest uh, humans I've ever met, and, and without a doubt, the greatest man I know. So I'm very fortunate in that sense. Everything I am, I am because of him and, and my mother and the choices they made. So we were homeschooled. Church was kind of our, our world, but my dad worked from home, and that's kind of what we did in the 80s and 90s. In 1999, I helped my dad plant a, a church for young people was my dad, my older sister, and I was uh, I was kind of one of the music guys doing worship leading. I had graduated college um, the year before. I graduated uh, community college when I was 17. I did post-secondary. I was a year ahead because I was homeschooled. I'm not very smart, but I worked very hard. So it was January of 99. We started this church called The Rock. Uh, three months later, I met um, the woman that I would marry. Actually, she came to know the Lord at this church and was, was baptized. I baptized her with my dad, and we fell in love. Um, three years later, we got married through some incredible trials, which I won't get into today. And our, our marriage really marked uh, the moment that the major trials would begin. And really, for the last 18 years, we, we just celebrated 18 years on, on Tuesday. <laughs> two days ago. Congratulations. Two days ago. Thank you. Um, but it, it really marked the beginning of a tremendous amount of trials for my family that is not really let up. Um, we had three boys uh, over the next uh, 18 year or 16 years of, of marriage. Um, 2018, at the beginning of the year, um, someone we didn't know very well, 
who was a part of our churches at one point in our in my youth, um, tweeted something very malicious towards my father. And uh, it seemed very harmless at first, very sad, but very harmless. Um, but the the churches we had grown up around, my dad had helped found, um, I, for lack of a better term, they just completely abandoned all principle and ideals and, uh, and really, I, I think, biblical protocol and just threw my dad to the wolves. Um, it was the most horrific, uh, uh, spiritually abusive situation I could possibly imagine. And my father really being kind of the, the founding pastor. Um, and watching watching them do what they did to my parents was unbearable. And in a sense, I really went to war for my father that year. Um, I was uh, you know, a, a house church leader. I was a music director um, leading small groups. It was my whole world. And I said, look, if you're not going to stand it for my father, I will. I die for him. And in doing so, I, I lost my job at the church and all my friends. Um, and in, in, midway through 2018, it was just this massive um, nuclear explosion and a total, complete severance of everything we'd ever known uh, our entire lives, just like that. And it was in a meeting with some of these pastors kind of early on in this this whole mess that I realized um, I, I sat down and I pulled up the Bible. and I said, you know, where in the Bible can you show me the verses that say you should be doing what you're doing? And they deferred to the lawyer in the room. And that's when I realized, wow, we're totally on our own. Wow. And I've been reading the same Bible as these guys my whole life in the same denomination, our non-denomination denomination, and we've come to very different conclusions, but one that has my father's life in the balance. Um, it destroyed my father's reputation and his work, his ministry, everything just gone. Um, and it wasn't the lie. It was the gasoline that the church poured on it. So our whole family sort of left reeling, and I, I told my family I'm never going back uh, to one of these churches ever again. Um, we don't know how to do church. We clearly got it wrong. And all I can see is the Bible is house church. So for now, that's what I'm going to do. And that's what I began doing with some friends. And December 2018, my little brother asked me to come over to his house. We're pretty close. And, but he was very nervous. He had something very important to tell me. And he sat in his basement about 8 o'clock at night over some whiskey and sourdough bread that he had made. And he pulled out this book called The Didache. And he began reading some passages to me. And then he began talking about these church fathers. And in that moment, Gary, I was like, it was like, I'm not how to describe it, a charism of the Holy Spirit, but a light bulb went on in my head that, oh, that's what we missed. Hmm. Uh, Catholicism. We're supposed to be Catholic. Wow. And I, without even a hesitation, Gary, I just thought, well, I guess I got to go. Join the Catholic Church. How does that work? So I began asking my brother some questions. So I converted technically that night. But I knew um, this might not go over that well uh, in my circle. I didn't know how badly it would actually be received. But at the time, I thought it might not go over well. So I better arm uh, myself. And I began just reading devouring books and essays. Probably the last year and a half, I've read 60, 70 books maybe five, 600 essays. I've gone through all the Fulton Sheen catechisms and a number of his other audio and videos um, to where I can, you know, I could probably teach RCIA at, at this point, uh, at least it would be a very unique experience of RCIA for anybody. Um, I don't want to teach it, uh, but I would have asked, I suppose. <laughs> so at the end of November of last year, um, it be, kind of began trickling out. And a dear friend of our family's, you know, wanted to know what was going on and wanted to kind of debate me over it. He was a, a lawyer, very dear man, loves the Lord. So we went back and forth in seven rounds of pretty uh, caustic emails. There was no name calling or anything, but he put Catholicism on trial. He told me once I'd make a great lawyer. So I I kind of put, put on my lawyer hat and for every sentence he would write, I would, I would write probably five or six sentences and apply. And we got to a point where he just realizes this, um, he didn't have any answers for my questions. I found that's a better way to go about talking to my friends is asking them to defend their positions. I don't feel I need to defend mine. 
I certainly can, and I can do it just from scripture. So he wished us, he wished me well, said he loved me, but unbeknownst to me, he sent this exchange out to my whole family. And, uh, and you know, the next couple of months got pretty, pretty difficult. And, um, so we're in a unique situation now. My, my parents have been tremendous, just tremendous. Of course, my father's, his big concern was, do you think I've lied to you or I don't know the Bible? And I said, dad, I think I'm here because of you, not in a bad way, but in a good way. I'm completing what you started. I'm finishing what you started. And I don't see this as a rejection of what you showed me, but as a completion. I'm not going from being Mormon to Catholic or being Jehovah's Witness to Catholic. I'm going from, you know, small C Catholic to big C Catholic. But because of the just unbelievable amount of uh, anti-Catholic vitriol and myth that really pervades the evangelical culture, um, it's very difficult to have that conversation. So it's been uh, hands down the most painful journey of my life, worse than than 2018 in, in a number of ways. I wouldn't say it's divided my family. It was very difficult having those conversations, much more than I was prepared to have. Um, so now I'm here, and three weeks ago, uh, I was offered a job at a parish just about 17 miles from our house to come in and be their new youth ministry coordinator guy, a job I swore I would never do when I was evangelical. Um but that's that's provided helped provide uh, some for our family. I still do a lot of my acting and ministry. That's a big piece of my life. But it's been great to take my passions and be able to marry them to the church, the ancient church, uh, in in that way. But that, in a nutshell, is my story. Wow. Yeah. And man, there's there's so much I want to ask you too. Uh, so uh, so you, but I, I, um, well, let's talk a little bit about that. Um, Music ministry, uh, obviously that's changed. Do you still uh, do ministry? I do. So I started an organization in 2016 called The Salvage Project, and the goal was to take my music, original music, into prisons, shelters, halfway houses, hospitals, um, memory care units, uh, group homes, work with people or youth with special needs, to bring music to people that needed it. It's a powerful tool for truth and for communication. And much like you see David using music to calm the evil spirits and, and King Saul, it really has a way of doing that for people with mental illness or trauma. And so for the next, you know, last six years, really the first four years in particular, um, I, I toured over a third of the country um, doing often three to sometimes ten performances a day in, in different prison shelters, halfway houses in, the, in a particular city where I had a church connection, and uh, it was a wonderful piece of music. Yeah. Well, hey, um, Jeremy, I hear the music coming up. We got to hit pause right there. Listen to Hands-On Apologetics. We're talking with Jeremy Darling about his conversion to the South. Stay tuned. Hi, this is Jesse Romero from the Terry and Jesse Show, also from Jesus 911. Let's face it, we all need to use the internet, but we need screen accountability. Why? Pornography is a huge problem, especially on the internet. And every time we tap into the internet, we get bombarded with images and temptations that degrade our humanity. So we need Covenant Eye to block these pornographic sites and advertisements from infiltrating our lives. Covenant Eyes helps us take custody of our eyes and custody of our intellect. So I recommend you go to CovenantEyes.com and type in the promo code BMPR to support the network. Protect yourself and your family from the eminent threats on the internet. www.CovenantEyes.com Code VMPR Live Porn Free. Thank you for listening to Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Thank you. God bless you. Keep the faith. If you shop on Amazon.com, there's an easy way to support Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Just visit smile.amazon.com and type in Catholic Resource Center under the desired charity. 
Now, when you log into your Amazon account and purchase products, a portion of it will automatically go to support Virgin Most Powerful Radio at no cost to you. Thanks in advance for supporting CRC and VMPR, and may God richly bless you and your family. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow! That's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. This is Jesse Romero. You're listening to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda on Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And welcome back, everybody. We're chatting with Jeremy Darling, a singer, songwriter, actor, um, speaker, advocate, and about his journey to the Catholic faith. Uh, Jeremy, you mentioned, you know, you started with a kind of seeker church. I don't know if many of our listeners would know exactly what that entails. I'd imagine that'd be very low church, low theology, um, well, what's the, the point of view from there? Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I'll give this caveat. I, I regret nothing. I echo father Richard John Newhouse you know, during his conversion. I regret nothing but my own shortcomings and, and mistakes. Um, the evangelical church brought me to Jesus Christ. The Catholic church brought me to my knees. And that really is the, the difference, um, in my life. So the seeker church, really was a tremendous outreach. It was geared and designed for the unchurched people. So there was a lot of Mm -hmm. hip music, um, hip dressing, and uh, hip messages. We didn't call them sermons. We called them messages. Um, Everything was really designed to bring in the unchurched and tell them about Jesus Christ. And in that sense, it was done very well, and it honored God. Uh, Was it Christ's design for church that he handed to his apostles? Uh, No, but they did the very best they could with what they knew. I grew up in a home devoted to living out Christian faith. How do you live? Um, how do we make it to the end? That that was what my father really um, was an expert at. There was not theology or philosophy really in our home. I, you know, As I got older in my faith, I realized I needed to defend my faith from, from atheism. And I listened to a lot of uh, Ravi Zacharias, uh, who recently passed, a tremendous man of faith. And, uh, and intellect. But uh, what I realized is you know, during my conversion, I, I had not loved God with my mind. Hmm. And the uh, there isn't a real intellectual tradition in the evangelical non-denominational expression uh, at all. Um, there might be in some circles, but they're really all Reformed uh, Calvinists who sort of tend to float in Baptist evangelical non-denominational circles. Those are all the people I'm really having thorough and intense debates with um, today. But that was the secret church. It was designed to be kind of edgy and, and cool. And it's to this day, it was simply a great way to get people to come into church, a great kind of entry point. And I'd like to bring some of that experience into the s- surrounding areas of the Catholic Church and help them see uh, you know, a man of Catholic faith um, presenting God uh, to the masses you know, outside of Mass. Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, so uh, you know, that it's such a big change at, as far as the church coming from that faith tradition uh, to the church where you have sacraments, you have uh, apostolic succession, bishops and all that. Now, now you mentioned uh, the didache that your brother was sharing with you. Um, what was it that jumped out at you that, you know, like you said, you turned the light on? Well, the first thing was how they received the bread and the wine, that they could not do so um, without making amends first. And that was my initial uh, understanding of confession, that that was happening that early on. And hearing you know, the word Catholic Church from Ignatius in about 100 AD, it, it, a light bulb really clicked, Gary. I had no idea what happened after the apostles died. And I had no idea how we got our Bible. I had no clue. If someone had asked me, I would have said, I, I don't know. I know Billy Graham was born at some point, and that's really all that mattered to me. Um, right. Wonderful man of God. Yeah. But that was what I knew. So uh, tr- truly what, what St. Newman said was the truth. Uh, to be to be deep in history is to cease to be Protestant. Just peering in the pages was like, 
we did, there was confession and talk of Mary in 8200 before. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, right. Uh, so for, for me, it was it was a it was unlike many of the other conversion stories I'd heard where there was a great wrestling and debating. I, I did not grow up in an anti-Catholic home. My dad had a great love and respect for many Catholics and disagreed with them, still does, um, but never spoke ill of them. I mean, certainly, I think probably if you were raised Catholic and came to our churches, you might have heard some anti-Catholic things said, but nothing, nothing approaching a James White kind of anti-Catholicism. My, we just didn't. We just loved Jesus. We didn't really talk about other people or other other denominations. We just did what we did. And if you love Jesus, then let's love Jesus together. So I didn't have anything to work through. Um, I had lost everything and had been brought low. And it was much easier for me to come into the church being low, <laughs> uh, being in the valley, so to speak. Because when you when you're in the valley, I think it was Chesterton that said you can see everything very clearly. I was as low as you can get. And everything was enormous. The enormity of history uh, of the church and of all of the questions in Scripture that had never been su- sufficiently answered, suddenly you open up the Bible and all you could see was Catholicism. It's all I could see, all of the Catholic verses. Um, it was uh, it was very clear to me that if, if the Catholic Church is that old, nothing has destroyed it. It's the largest denomination on earth, larger than all the other denominations combined. And if you add in, you know, Eastern Orthodox and Anglican, which are kind of functionally Catholic, it's I'm in the minority and I have been for centuries. And where is my church and group of churches? Our whole movement, 43 years is as long as it lasted. Now it's gone from one tweet. Yeah. That's not a foundation of, of stone. That's a foundation of sand. I put all that together in about five minutes and it was like, I'm done. So I was received officially on Pentecost. Just this past May, um, it uh, for any number of reasons, it, I needed to just be patient and, and wait. That was that was one of the hardest things I ever had to do. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I bet. W- were there any uh, major obstacles for you? I know a lot of converts really have difficulty with Marian teaching, uh, just because it's it seems so foreign, especially for uh, you That's know more just, evangelical. So no, none. There there were no. Um, there was nothing theologically that I had an issue with, not even uh, I, I was eager to it was like I struck a vein of gold and um, I just kept digging. The stuff with Mary was actually probably one of the, the easiest things for me uh, for a whole number of levels. Um, number one, I have to assume she spent her life with John whenever she died. John must have loved her and hugged her and kissed her and asked her to pray for him. The, all the apostles must have. That's not, that's not hard for me to extrapolate from Scripture. Um, so the question really was, um, if she is still a part of the mystical body, why can't I love her and hug her and kiss her in some way? I, <laughs> that's not worshiping her. Um, and if the devil hates her and scripture makes it clear from Genesis to Revelation that he does, then I, I can definitely love her. If Jesus loved her, I can love her. Um, and if someone came into my house and refused to speak to my mom, that's the last time I'd invite them over until we straightened that out. So... None of that was hard for me to, to grasp. Um, the idea that these saints had been lost all my friends, that I now had access to the community of saints, including Mary and Joseph, to pray for me was profoundly, profoundly comforting and eye-opening to me to have them and their prayers and their care about me here in my pilgrimage was tremendous. So the, I, I don't, I do not understand why people have an issue with Mary. Certainly if they think Catholics are worshiping or making her God, yeah, that's a big problem. Uh, but I could see very quickly that that was not the case, that they had a deep love and reverence for this unbelievable woman. So I ask my friends, you know, now it's very easy to get past this conversation. I, I talked to a friend who was confirmed Catholic. He's no evangelical. And he asked about that. I said, well, can I ask you some questions? He said, sure. I said, do you think, um, that her soul magnifies the Lord? And he said, no, I don't. I said, okay, you think that she's full of grace? He said, you mean I think she's perfect? I said, do you think she's full of grace? He said, well, if you're asking me if she's perfect, I think, no, she wasn't. I said, okay, do you think all ages should rise up and call her blessed? He said, no, I don't. I said, okay, we just denied three scriptures. (laughs) So I just opened them up and I read those three verses to him. I said, I believe her soul magnifies the Lord. I believe that she's full of grace and that we should rise up and call her blessed. So I do. Yeah. And that was the end of that conversation. <laughs> um, I found, Gary, among even the Reformed theologians that are really prepared for these debates, is they have a very narrow and thin reading of Scripture. 
um, as I did. I didn't see these, every word is dripping with divine authority from scripture. I just saw them as like, hey, that's kind of a cool story. And I had that experience with a friend. I was reading him The Road to Emmaus, a reformed theologian friend of mine. And I said, here's the mass right here. Jesus takes these men through scripture, gives them a homily and breaks bread. And then he disappears. That's the mass. And he said, or it's just, you know, a cool story of guys talking on the road. And I said, that's the problem, isn't it? Yeah. You have, that's how you read scripture. That's not how I read scripture, but you could see how someone could get the mass from something like that. Right. I just think scripture is a lot bigger. Um, and I found that, you know, with any verse that you read, once you start kind of peeling back those Catholic verses, particularly around salvation, which is like the precious baby to, to uh, many in the evangelical faith, as it should be, it gets very scary. Um, so it's often the first question anybody's had for me is, you know, do you think I'm going to hell now? <laughs> and yeah. I got to walk them through a separated brethren and all of that doctrine and those things that God is, that we're bound to the sacraments that God is not, but the sacraments are a gift to us and they make life a lot easier. And once you know, as in know and understand, um, you know, then, then we're held accountable for those things, but they're heavy conversations for sure. The big issue, Gary, for everyone in my life is it's so complex. They tell me there's so much. Now, that's the point. I think it was Chesterton that said nothing God made is simple. It's all complex. Yeah. And working through the complexities for me has been a great joy. Learning, knowing God because knowledge serves love. Knowing him more. I found all I found is just oceans of Jesus. Not the incarnation confined at one point in time, but expanding exponentially through time. And Mary and Joseph and the apostles and martyrs and the sacraments and beauty. That's all I found is just beauty. I, I, I this, You could put me on the rack. I, I just can't, I can't stop, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's kind of like love. You know, uh, when you love somebody, there there's something, it's not simple. And in one level it is, but on another level, it's deep, It's there's mystery, there's complexities, uh, there's things that you don't like, but in some ways is endearing. You know what I mean? It, it's it, yeah. On the level of love, I mean, it's... Uh, that's a complex phenomenon. So why would it be different for a loving God? It's a great analogy, actually. Yeah, that's a great analogy. And even exponentially more infinitely difficult <laughs> to explain yeah, right. to people. Right. Uh, especially those that really do love the Lord. Um, it, it's funny, evangelicals, they, they struggle with the complexity. But in that admission, they admit they really do kind of think they know enough and have somehow kind of peaked. Um, that there's nothing left to learn. Now, they wouldn't admit that out loud if you asked them, but that's that's the implication, whether they meant to imply that or not. I'm trying really hard to be gracious. There are days that I feel like I'm being torn apart. Uh, most days I feel like I'm being torn apart. Yeah, yeah. Well, hey, I hear the music coming up, Jeremy. We're chatting with Jeremy Darling about his journey of faith into the Catholic Church. Uh, more to come on the other side of the break. You're listening to Hands On Apologetics. Welcome, Daniel. You're on the line. What's on your mind, brother? Hi, I just wanted to share a testimony about Virgin Most Powerful Radio. I had a buddy at work who, you know, he a lukewarm Catholic guy, and I wanted him to start listening to the Terry and Jesse show, so I kept telling him to download the app, and he kept putting me off. So one day, I grabbed his phone, and I downloaded the app <laughs> for him. I went on vacation, and you know, I kept telling him to listen to it. He would kind of put me off. I came back from vacation. He comes to my cubicle, and he says to me, Hey, man, I've been listening to Terry and Jesse's show, and it's great. And it's uh, made a big impact in his life. The guy, he's going to weekly adoration a couple times a wow. week. He goes to the Mass in the morning. Mm -hmm. uh, he's an on-fire Catholic, and he promotes the Terry and Jesse show on the Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Daniel, what a testimony. And I want to encourage our listeners to get those cards by going to virginmostpowerfulradio.org and uh, do what Daniel's doing. Go out and spread the faith by inviting people to listen to Virgin Most Powerful. Daniel, thanks for your testimony, brother. God love you. You're welcome. Jesus said in Luke 17, when you have done all that you were ordered to do, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have only done our duty. 
According to St. John of the Cross, God is pleased with the little deeds we do in secret. He takes more pleasure in these than in a multitude of grand works that we may do out of the desire to be seen by others. May God help us to do the things that please Him and not just to appear great in the eyes of others. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow! That's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Now, back to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda. If you'd like to join the conversation, call 888-526-2151. Here's Gary. And welcome back, everybody, Hands-On Apologetics. And we're chatting with Jeremy Darling about his journey of faith into the Catholic Church. And, Jeremy, you know, right before the break, you made a really important point that I think a lot of Catholics need to keep in mind is when we're talking about issues concerning salvation, there really is a fear factor. I think sometimes we make it out to be kind of abstract, you know, as, uh, oh, faith and works or eternal security, that's easy, that's unbiblical. But uh, from the other side of the conversation, for someone, let's say, who holds on to once saved, always saved, uh, that there's a lot of fear because you're you're essentially saying, hey, you don't have the assurance you think you do. Uh, yeah. it's really easy just to say, Hey, I don't want to talk about it. Yeah. You know, I, I released an essay at becoming Catholic faith and it's kind of my story, but it's really kind of a soft catechism because it walks through top to bottom. Um, what you would walk through a beginner, but I really meant to just, it's something my family can read. If this conversation is too hard to have, you can read it. But the part on salvation was, is pretty heavy, and I, I made a point to note about 18 verses, different verses in Scripture that in the New Testament that talk about how we're saved, 18 different ways. Um, so I, the phrase I, I use, I've seen floating around, is I, I am saved, I am being saved, I hope to be saved. Um, I'm not worried uh, about my salvation. I wasn't worried when I became Catholic. I know that those that are in Christ are in Christ. Um, I think um, if I died today, there might be a little bit of cleaning up that needed to be done. Um, and I thought through those things quite a bit. But the, the there's nothing in Scripture that says our future sins are forgiven. There's nothing. It's an indefensible position in every conceivable way, which is why Calvin came up with his doctrine. Um, it's easier to find double predestination and election and make an argument for that than it is to make an argument for uh, once saved, always saved. Um, I know I uh, live my life for Jesus Christ as imperfectly as it is. I'm not going uh, to abandon him. And I know he's not going to abandon me. I also recognize that I really wrestled pre-Catholicism with my sin. Why am I still dealing with these things? Why can't I get rid of them for once and for all? And, and if God can see them, do I acknowledge them? And I remember my first confession was pretty incredible. I, for some converts, may, maybe don't have a great story. Mine was amazing. It was very simple. I didn't bawl my eyes out. But you going through 30 years of your life saying, I did this times without number and that times without number. I did the Fulton Sheen model of the first confession. Yeah. Um, it was extremely liberating and uh, recognizing a great need in my heart, which was to hear my dad, my, my father, my heavenly father, say, I forgive you. And this is what I was missing in my evangelical tradition was the supernatural, substantial touch of God that we get in the sacraments and, and how he meets us there that he, when I look at my little baby, I've got a daughter now, she was born Ash Wednesday and was a very much a Catholic gift and part of my story. I would not have had her uh, had I not discovered the fullness, um, but I see her shoving her fist in her mouth all the time, as babies do, and they put everything in her mouth. We have a need to be nourished. And pre-Catholicism, I didn't think Christ could do that. I have a need to hear someone say, I forgive you when I hurt them. Pre-Catholicism, I didn't know how Jesus did that. 
Um, so in the sacraments, we get a substantial touch of God that, that meets our nature, the spiritual side of our nature, um, in a physical way. And it was Fulton Sheen that really opened up my eyes to that. He explains the sacraments incredibly and how they relate the, the spiritual side to this physical side. So un- understanding that um, was, I think, critical to helping me see the, the beauty of the fullness of sal- the salvation doctrine and the, sal- the salvific effects, so to speak. Because pre-Catholicism, it, it, frankly, it's really hard to, to live a righteous life. That's why I respect my father so much. I've never seen in my life any Christian work so hard to stay on the straight and narrow. My dad would go out for hours when I was a kid and bawl his eyes out, begging God to change him. Um, so distraught over his sin. That's perfect contrition as far as I'm concerned. I've never seen it anywhere else. Yeah. And I told this to my parents. I said, you know, mom and dad, I've never, I've never met people like you. In our entire life, in all of our movements, all of the evangelical world that we've lived in. I've never met anybody like the two of you. It should not be. If Christ is as revolutionary as he is, I should meet a lot more of you. And I did. Finally, when I looked through the pages of Christian history, they just all had saints attached to fix to their first name. Right. Um, that's where I found my mother and father again. And that, that if that sealed the deal, I suppose maybe that was it. Um, but how that affects our salvation and how Christ is sort of aiding us in this beautiful supernatural way because we need a touch of supernatural. We need it. I had none of it before. We need that touch. Now it's just, to me, the, the salvation question is I'm, I'm not worried about it. Not because I do, but because I get to cooperate with God in a very unique way um, that meets me and meets my needs in a way I didn't before. It is incredibly fulfilling. Yeah. Yeah. I I think there's a temptation, not just within Protestantism, but even in Catholicism, to uh, reduce the faith to kind of a a interior thought, you know, Uh, this uh, interior belief that really has no manifestation in the outside world. Uh, You know what I mean? So with the sacraments, like you said, it's kind of uh, you have that, uh, like you said, touch of God, a substantial touch of God where uh it's more than just an idea it's your whole body as well you know you're not just offering your mind you're offering your whole self about that the last couple of weeks i what i would call my 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 previous evangelical life was a religion of imagination Hmm. i knew the lord i could i tried to picture him during worship songs you know big powerful four chord pop progression worship songs that the church never had before and i had him in letters um, but if I only knew my wife on the other side of the world through letters and pictures, but no intimacy, I mean, boy, you couldn't get very deep. Um, the sacraments provide that intimacy and that touch of God that takes him out of my imagination, which in and of itself is still powerful. That's the power of Jesus Christ. But into the real world with eyes and senses connected, um, smelling, touching, hearing, seeing, um, Hearing him say, I forgive you, kissing him in the Eucharist, those, those kind of things I didn't have before. And it's no wonder the evangelical church is struggling so badly. It's no wonder there's 50,000 different sects of like, Christianity, if you could call it that, on earth today. Because if you're just going off scripture, y- you go anywhere. I mean, I, I start every conversation now with the Reformed theologian with John 16. Jesus tells the disciples, I haven't told you everything because you can't bear it. I'll send the Holy Spirit. He'll guide you into all truth. Right there, that's the development of doctrine. He didn't say, I'll send you the Bible. He said, I'll send you the Holy Spirit. And I fast forward to Acts, the Council of Jerusalem. Right here, this is it working in practice. They didn't know if Jews were still supposed to be circumcised. They didn't know. Oh, that's a good question. Let's get the churches together. Then I fast forward to 1 Timothy 3.15, where Paul tells Timothy, the church, not, not the Bible, is the pillar and foundation of the truth. Um, so you either read those as, well, that's not how I read those verses, which is the answer I get, or you look at them through a Catholic lens, which is the Holy Spirit was to guide the church for the next 2,000 years, and he wouldn't just do that with letters on a page. He would do it in a real and substantial way. Yeah, 
Yeah, very well put. Well, uh, you know, it's all those gifts and uh, wonderful gifts that your parents gave you, your, your uh, evangelical church gave you, uh, that you said, you know, comes to completion in Catholicism. Uh, what does evangelicalism have to offer for Catholics? I mean, it's, it's not just a one-way street, right? Oh, oh, for sure. And I, I've been talking about this a lot as well. You can feel the pain to the schism. Yeah. The, the Catholic is missing um, what I would call holy emotions mm-hmm. and uh, a great vibrancy and a great desire to see people come to know Jesus Christ. That's been my whole world. I mean, all I've done for the last 15 years is find any way I could get to talk to people about Jesus. We did this outreach called Religion is a Lie, where we would stand on milk crates around lakes here in the Twin Cities with shirts that said Religion is a Lie. We'd just stand there smiling at people as they would run past. And by the time they passed 10 or 15, they would stop and say, what does this mean? We would explain, um, God never meant for there to be all these religions. He wants to know you in a personal way. Anyone that tells you you have to work for God's favor is lying to you or has been lied to. And I never pictured Catholics, you know, trying to reach Catholics. I was picturing atheists or the end of the church, but a lot of the people that I, from that previous life, were like, didn't you say religion is a lie? I said, well, it is, but the word appears in the Bible. True religion is these three things, and I'm doing that, so I guess I'm religious. <laughs> we had another <laughs> called um, I Will Listen because shrinks are too expensive, and we'd sit on a couch on a busy lake with a sign that said I Will Listen because shrinks are too expensive, and we'd just sit. People would come and spill their guts. I mean, suicide attempts and crime. I mean, they just sit and confess. Wow. They just confess. We have a need to confess, Gary. And that's clear in society, but we also, of course, need absolution when the Catholic Church can offer that. Um, So we were doing that. I was doing music. And, of course, through the Salvage Project, I was preaching the gospel to thousands of people all over the country in prisons, shelters, halfway houses, seeing people make a decision to embrace him as their savior. um, But I recognize in in the writings of, of Pope Benedict that often in my circle, the gospel was um, kind of hijacked in over and against the church um, in, or misappropriated maybe is a better word. And so I'm, I'm careful not to do that now as I'm trying to kind of meld the good news, the gospel, the church, all of those things. Cause you can't just do what we did, which is invite someone off the street to come to your church, coming to masses. It's overwhelming and sure. very mystical and weird if you don't know what's going on. And certainly sure. there's maybe appropriate times to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's a, a different kind of process now. And certainly if I'm working with a lot of these Protestant organizations going into prisons, I'm definitely I'm encouraging people to believe and be baptized where I wasn't necessarily emphasizing baptism before. Okay. Yeah, very good. Well, Jeremy, hey, uh, looks like our time's running out. And I want you to uh, direct people. Where can they get uh, more information about you and your ministries? Well, the best thing to do is probably Google me, J-E-R-O-M-Y, darling, Um or jeremydarling.com, my essays at becomingcatholic.faith, my ministry is The Salvage Project, um, and my speaking, I speak in schools on sex and pornography and human trafficking, and that's up at thespokesman.live. But if you Google my name, you'll probably find all of those in my records. I just put it under the record uh, about three months ago, was pre-Catholic and post-Catholic <laughs> uh, record. Um, <laughs> in a lot of my old songs. I've been on this journey probably a lot longer than I realize. All right. Very good. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. We appreciate it. All right. That's Jeremy Darling. Yeah, check him out. Uh, Lots of great stuff, great ministry. I can't believe the hour is gone. But uh, coming up next, the Terry and Jesse show. Uh, Thank you for tuning in, everybody. And God willing, we'll be back after Labor Day. Bye-bye. In the 1990s, I lived and worked in Hollywood. But when my wife Betty's mom took ill, we relocated to Orange County. And it was during this time in our lives that I converted to Catholicism. Once my eyes were opened to the truth, I couldn't learn enough about the faith. But I had less free time than ever, especially with a long commute. That's when I discovered the real value of Catholic audio. Listening to cassette tapes transformed my daily commute into a miniature retreat. And that's the beauty of Virgin Most Powerful Radio today. Since the podcasts are archived, you can listen anytime on our smartphone app. 
I know how listening to Catholic audio can bring you closer to Christ and His Church. So I encourage you to visit the App Store or go to vmpr.org and download the app today. It just might change your life. I'm Matthew Arnold for Virgin Most Powerful Radio.